officially. And welcome to our Hebrews Bible study on Wednesday, on November the 18th, at 7 p.m. We have completed on Sunday, we uh, finished covering Hebrews chapter 9, and going to go on to part of chapter 10 today. And as we, as we do that coverage, uh, just to get us into today's study, would like to just take a look at the ending verses of chapter 9, that, that these copies of the things in, in heaven and these sacrifices that were not perfect, uh, they were replaced um, by this. Uh, verse 28 talks about that perfect sacrifice of Christ. Um, offered only once to take away the sins of many. And uh, he will appear that second time without sin to bring salvation to those who are eagerly waiting for him. And we have that, we have that assurance we're looking forward to. Again, remember the whole point of Hebrews is that uh, superiority of, our, of Christ as the Savior. Chapter 10 then will present the conclusion of the doctrinal portion of this letter to the Hebrews. Uh, there's going to be a, quite a bit more repetition uh, and also reinforcement by repetition uh, of that superiority of Christ and his all-sufficient sacrifice for sin. So, uh, Niles, would you go ahead and from chapter 10, go ahead and take uh, that first paragraph, verses 1 through 4. In fact, the law is only a shadow of the good things to come, not the actual realization of those things. It will never be able to make perfect those who continually offer the same sacrifices year after year. If it could do this, would they not have stopped bringing sacrifices? Because the worshipers, once they were cleansed, would no longer have a bad conscience about sins. Instead, these sacrifices reminded them of their sins year after year. The fact is that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. All right. Uh, uh, echoed themes and points from earlier. Uh, we had that shadow uh, mentioned in the previous chapter that, uh, that why that uh, isn't as good as the reality, the actual realization as it's translated here. Obviously, um, you don't just look at a, at a photo of somebody when the person himself or herself is right there. And so we, we have really a summary, five points of the Old Testament sacrificial system here that re reference to the law as that whole system of, that, of sacrifices. Uh, it's inadequate. Uh, and so that, you know, inadequacy is really seen in just that word only and repeated in other matters. Uh, be only inadequate because it's a shadow, it's not the real thing. And because it's a shadow, um, they were not able to cleanse sins, right? Uh, if, they, if it could have actually removed sins and cleaned the conscience, um, then they would have stopped doing those sacrifices. Uh, the year after year sacrifice takes us to the, the day, the great day of atonement. Obviously, the um, that uh, that's not saying that it was only once a year, right? Not only was the Great Day of Atonement a sacrifice annually, other sacrifices were done every day. And you know, a constant action almost we can think of going on in the temple. And, and that repeated nature, right? Again, the words year after year, reminded of sins. And animal blood can't take away uh, human sin. So really, again, those, those five points that lead us to the conclusion that the whole book of, uh, the whole book of Hebrews is saying, look to Christ, look at Christ, Christ is the Savior. Uh, any question to, uh, for you or comments for me on these, these uh, first four verses? Uh, again, quite a bit of repetition. And you may have comments. I'm, uh, I'm trying, I'm going to try not to go over it as, more deeply than I have been in previous lessons. But uh, uh, two days ago on Monday, I actually translated most of uh, chapter 10 for, with, with the, uh, 
the other pastors uh, at our circuit meeting. So it's kind of a preparation. So while I do have a few more Greek references, I don't, uh, I don't wanna get more deep than you're able to appreciate. But any comments on those first four verses? Yes, Sue, please. Um, it, it was just um, on my mind, and I don't know if I'm off here, but if they could only perform sacrifices in Jerusalem, and that was, um, and, and most of the people were not there, then it seems like it would have not been a very, um, uh, a, a good presence in their daily life for the for the Jews who were not near to know those sacrifices were happening daily. Um, whereas in the once Christ had died and people were meeting and being more um, uh, working together, sharing together, eating together, praying together, that should have been, I would think, more supportive for them. Yeah, the, right. There, there's elements of that Old Testament worship that limited the participation. Uh, yeah. Three times a year, remember, that all of the faithful Israelites had to go to Jerusalem and be present for those sacrifices. Um, and so that was something that they did have to do, and they were to make that trek uh, uh, three times a year. Uh, they did have the synagogues, those gathering places where they went every Saturday because they additionally had that law of the Sabbath. Um, and, and again, you're right. The, the law regulating that word um, has its weaknesses. Um, it has, you know, it, it has in some way it's, it's a bit easier because you're told exactly what you have to do. And freedom for a Christian, you're treated more like a mature child. And you know you you have that that uh, ability to select. Okay, now do I go to church on Saturday late afternoon, or do I go to first service or second service on Sunday? So you have that freedom, which is a big blessing. But then, um, it, 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 yeah, that big blessing of it, it is definitely points us to the superiority of, of Christ, and and it does take that extra effort which is a good thing. Uh, Sue, you want to follow up on that? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm not being very clear here. Um, if you um, only basically are worshiping three times a year by the end of three and a half months, I would think you would get a little careless or a little slack. And I know you said there was the, um, the Sabbath worship but that did that happen in their home or did that happen in the temple? And what about women? They must have felt a bit like not very involved or supported. Right. The, the right the women's place, obviously, would that you know there was a there was a distinction that was made um, in, in a lot of things, and that was taken down in the New Testament as well. So their participation would have been limited. Um, and, and, and then also the synagogue would not have had sacrifices, but that Sabbath didn't happen in the home. It, it did happen. They did typically have a gathering at the synagogue uh, on every Sabbath. Um, anywhere that there were at least three uh, adult men to gather. And those three adult men in a town would gather, you know, and, and then more would be a part of it as well. Um, so that, that did happen regularly. So they weren't totally on their own. But yes, you're very right that uh, this, is, this is another one. You just highlighted another one or a few of the uh, shortcomings of that shadow of the Old Testament law and sacrificial system. Thank you. So let's go on then to uh, verses five through seven here, which is going to talk about how we look at Christ, who's more superior, a uh, cat who, who not more superior is superior. Kathy, would you, uh, uh, if you're available, to read this? Uh, this quote, uh, verses five through seven. Five through seven. 
Therefore, when he entered the world, Christ said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire that you prepared a body for me. You were not pleased with burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, Here I am. I have come to do your will, God. In the scroll of the book, it is written about me. Okay, so um, some very uh, wonderful things about this quote here from Psalm number 40. If you recall, it's a long time ago that we covered Psalm 40 uh, um, in, our, in our psalm study, but we did have a little bit of a comment about how this talked about Christ because the writer to the Hebrews is specifically saying this is a messianic psalm, right? Christ said this, um, these words that uh, were recorded by the psalm, psalmist. And, um, and these verses do present Christ from Psalm 40, verses 16 through 18. And what are they saying? The sacrifice and offering you didn't desire. Uh, there's a, a general word in the Greek and Hebrew for a sacrifice. A uh, sacrifice of animals in which you killed the animal. Uh, offering is another type of sacrifice, um, but that would usually refer more to the grain offering uh, and, and oftentimes the fellowship offering, a given thing rather than a slaughtered animal. Um, we didn't want to jump down to verse six. Uh, the burnt offerings, that Greek word is actually the Greek word Holocaust. And yes, that's related to what's uh, what uh, um, uh, what we know from World War II, that unfortunate situation of the burning of those human bodies. And, and the burnt offerings, the Holocausts weren't of people in the Old Testament. They were of the animals, but they were the offerings that were burnt entirely, uh, showing that total dedication to God. Uh, the phrase sin offerings would have been any of the sacrifices that were given, uh, which represented um, forgiveness. Uh, oftentimes the blood sprinkled upon the people or the lamb uh, of the Passover blood uh, painted on the doorposts. Um, and so, so the sacrifice word up above uh, that would have been death of an animal, but oftentimes that those sacrifices could have actually been eaten by the priests, um, or portions of it were. So all of those did not please God because they were only shadows. Questions about any of those four types of sacrifices? The book of uh, Leviticus and Numbers would have quite a bit more if you really wanted to delve into that. One of the interesting things here about verse 5 here, where it says, but you prepared a body for me, is that the Hebrew, and you'll even notice in our EHV translation, uh, they go with a, a translation of the Hebrew that says, ears you have opened. And... Um, and the Greek actually paraphrased the Hebrew, and, and it's not just the Greek uh, writer of, of the, to the Hebrews, uh, it was the Septuagint, uh, and uh, that translation of the Hebrew into Greek uses that phrase, you prepared a body for me. And we would say, okay, so the Holy Spirit has the writer to the Hebrews use the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew. Um, so is basically the Holy Spirit's endorsing that Septuagint translation as valid. How do you get from a body you prepared for me to ear or ears you have opened to get to a body you prepared for me? I'm letting you think about that for a moment. Well, when your ears are opened and you listen to somebody, what does that oftentimes mean? Even in our English, if, if my ears are open, that means I'm listening and then following through on doing what I hear, right? Um, so if your ears are open, the body follows suit. And so we see that, uh, that as, as, a, uh, as a valid way for us to understand this. Um, there are some commentators that talk about the possibility that the ears you have opened for me 
Um, you know, when, when slaves would have their ears pierced with a ring, that would mean that they belonged to their owner and were to do his will. Some have said that this could, that could be, that, that slave mentality could be what's presented here, that, that doing of the master's will. Um, but I, I think that the better one is just recognizing if you hear what your master says, if your ears are opened, well, then the whole body follows along. Carol, thoughts or questions on that? So is that like, um, Christ often talks about being here to do the Father's will. So he heard God and did what he needed to do. What He obeyed God, in other words. Yes. He, he, right. His, his whole life was following the Father's will. And you're right. Um, so really a, a wonderful summary that, um, that God prepared this body for him. And one of the, one of the pastors on Monday suggested that these verses five through eight are really a wonderful Christmas day message talking about the incarnation and the whole purpose of Christ's coming. Um, and, and it takes you from this cute little baby in the manger of Christmas and actually gets you to God giving him a body with the goal of being the one who sacrifices himself, uh, does God's will, that, that whole plan of salvation um, and how it's written about Christ in the scroll of the book, um, the, the heading of the scroll that's all written about Christ. So any questions or comments on, on understanding that this Psalm number 40, talking about uh, the Christ coming to replace the offerings that could not be or never were sufficient so that his sacrifice is sufficient. All right, I'm glad you don't have any questions, but even though you don't have questions, the writer to the Hebrews decided that he would repeat the point and even repeat the, uh, the, the quote from the Old Testament. Uh, Carol, could you read these verses eight through 10, which conclude that, oh, ah, sorry, my That's okay. computer took off there. So verses eight through 10, please. Sure. First he said, sacrifices and offerings that were offered according to the law, both burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire and you were not pleased with them. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified once and for all through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Okay, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, each of the sections in this summary found in chapter 10, uh, like verse 10 here, is a, is a one sentence summary of, of the work of Christ. Okay, and so I'm gonna get back to that in just a minute, but we'll, we'll, we'll see, that, um, see that here. So verse eight uh, just repeats that. Repeated phrases underscore the point. Sacrifices didn't do the work. Sacrifices did not please God. That's on the negative. On the positive side, the sacrifice of Christ, that was the Father's will. And because the Father's will was for Christ to die with that body prepared for him, that's what the first order, right? The first way is done away with in order to establish the second. Uh, what is that? The Old Testament sacrifices of the Levitical law and the Levite priesthood, uh, the descendants of Aaron, their work has been abolished, done away with, and it's established the New Testament or the these times after Christ has given that sacrifice for sin. Uh, verse 10 if you see that again, I'm going to buy this will. We have been sanctified once and for all through the sacrifice of the body of Christ. Uh, just thinking how this, this being sanctified. And, and sanctification has two 
general, two meanings. I, I shouldn't say two general meanings. There's two meanings of sanctified. There's understanding sanctification in the broad sense and sanctification in the narrow sense. Sanctification in just in its literal definition means being made holy. That's the word sanctus or saint is in it, being made holy. Well, in the broad sense, sanctification is forgiveness and living a holy life. That's what we have here. We have in the broad sense, being made holy, that justification and the, the, the result of it, that God seeing us as holy, that we live a life uh, as well. Um, sanctification in the broad sense. In the narrow sense, which we get down to, that'll be the end of chapter 10, which we'll study in, in our next session on Sunday. That's doing good works to say thank you to God. Um, the, the, and, and the work of the Holy Spirit is sanctification, both in the broad sense and in the narrow sense, right? Because of that work that Christ Jesus did. Any questions or comments about um, this all-sufficient sacrifice of Christ? I guess I should highlight one more thing here. That's uh, repetition. Uh, some favorite words here about why Christ is sufficient and superior. Once and for all. Um, uh, and then one other thing. Uh, earlier in, in chapters 8 and 9, we talked about the sacrifice of Christ. Chapters 8 and 9, they mentioned Christ sacrificed himself. Uh, chapter 9 talked about the sacrifice of blood. Now, the sacrifice of the body. All three the same sacrifice, but um, just different, different pictures that give us the, the additional meaning to it there. Thoughts or questions on, on any of those things that, that I've brought up. The doing away of the Old Testament replaced with the new once and for all, the body of Christ being sacrificed one time. All right. I'm going to catch my breath then as we move on down just a little bit here and see again the repetition, Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. Uh, let's see, Carol, uh, um, no, Sue, I think it, um, I don't know, Carol, want to go back to you. I said Carol first. I have no idea who read last. Um, Carol, can you read this next paragraph, verses 11 to 14? Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. In the one case, every priest stood ministering day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which are never able to remove sin. In the other case, this priest, after he offered one sacrifice for sin, for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Since then, he has been waiting until his enemies are made a footstool under his feet. By only one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. Okay, so thank you. Um... So Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. And if you were listening to Carol, you might have thought to yourself, this sounds repetitious. <laughs> and it is. Um, the, right? The, the repeated sacrifice. That was the whole point of chapter 9, the sacrifice of blood. The over and over again, they're not able to remove sin, not able to cleanse the conscience. Um, and But the one distinction between chapter 9 and chapter 10, talking about repeated sacrifices, um, in chapter 9, it was really year after year, focusing on the great day of atonement. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about the every day, that ongoing sacrifice. The focus was on the day of atonement year after year. Here in verse 11, while we think of the the in addition to that year after year, we have day after day. And so the morning and evening sacrifices, if you're interested in finding out more of those details, especially Numbers 28, verses 3 through 8, detail exactly what's supposed to happen 
twice a day. Uh, so just the common priest, this wasn't the high priest. He was assigned um, the sacrifice for that day. What did he do? He had to sacrifice a one-year-old male unblemished lamb. He included with that a grain offering. What was that? A quarter of an ephah of fine flour. And, and thinking about um, uh, an ephah, I think uh, it is similar to what would, what would be a, a quart in weight, quart size, the container, uh, mixed with a quarter hen of, uh, of olive oil. That quarter hen, I believe, is about uh, uh, the size of a cup. So maybe, uh, and then a quarter hen of wine was also a drink offering poured out. Sounds like uh, he was making a, a fish fry on Friday, right? Except a lamb fry. Uh, um, so, but yeah, almost the recipe for giving God a meal, grain, oil, and the lamb, and then that wine as well. Um, obviously God doesn't need the, need the uh, God doesn't need the food for his sustenance, but that picture of, of all of this effort and this work in addition to the, the, the actual uh, death of the unblemished land. Um, yeah, a lot to be going on twice a day in, in the temple. Questions about that, uh, that ongoing sacrifice there in verse 11? Okay, obviously could not remove sin. Um, verse 12 repeats Hebrews 1.3. He offered that sacrifice for all time and sat down at the right hand of God. Um, so it takes us, uh, you know, about 10 chapters to get all the way into this repetition. But, you know, the, the, the good teachers oftentimes in class will at the beginning of the lesson, this is what I'm going to teach you today. And they actually state the point, right? And then they go through it and they work up to how they how they get there, and then they, you know, oftentimes will state, restate exactly what they said earlier as the goal of the meeting, uh, the goal of the class. So this priest did just that. And this priest here is the singular, not the plural. We have the one priest, Jesus Christ. Um, we, we move to verse 13. And the comment to the about the enemies, uh, he he's done that work, completed this one-time sacrifice for sin, but he hasn't come back to judge the world, as we talked about at the end of chapter nine. He's waiting. He's waiting until his enemies are made a footstool under his feet. Uh, that uh, thought of the enemies, I've made the comment or note here in the in the notes, Philippians two ten through eleven. Uh, that's where every knee will confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And those will either be willing believers confessing it or the unbelievers forced to make that confession on their knees as they are sentenced to hell forever. So that even, even the enemies will see that. Um, uh, and and the, the Greek uh, actually does the same thing the English does. Uh, footstool under feet. Um, I don't think there's any other way that you use a footstool correctly, um, but it, it underscores the fact of, of Christ's superiority uh, again. Uh, any questions uh, that those thoughts uh, bring about for you? Um, yeah, uh, Sue, go ahead. Um, when I think about the priest offering that sacrifice day after day, I wonder if they ever became mechanical about it, um, it because they were never seeing a, a good result. And th that perhaps made it even less appreciated by God because not only couldn't it do it, but possibly they weren't, um, it, it, maybe their whole heart wasn't in it. But then when Christ made his sacrifice, you can almost see um, when he sat down, uh, you know, on, on the throne beside God, you can almost see how triumphant he was. Um, and just now I'm, it's done. I, you know, nothing more needs to be done. I'm waiting now. 
Yeah, right. Um, yeah, a couple of comments are probably in that Old Testament. I can see those priests uh, perhaps um, getting ritualistic with it because it was definitely a ritual. Uh, and yet at the same time, there were probably some priests who took it so seriously that they never became ritualistic. <laughs> Um, and so just like, uh, just like we, we know the human heart today, um, sometimes it's distracted, sometimes not. So that, that is a, a good comment about how the repeated ritual uh, has its benefits of teaching and, and being accustomed to it. But then like we do with the Lord's Prayer, what happens to us today? How many times do I say the Lord's Prayer? Um, wondering about the next thing that I have to do rather than really thinking about and praying those words. Uh, in our pastor study, we also studied the Lord's Prayer on Monday, and uh, the quote was, was made uh, from Professor Daniel Deutschlander, uh, who's, who's passed away and gone to be in heaven here recently, a little while ago, but he said that the Lord's Prayer is the most often prayed Christian prayer at the same time as being the least often prayed prayer. If you think about how often it's said with people's minds wandering. Uh, Sue, any follow up on that with that ritualistic nature? I, th I think that probably is all I was thinking. Okay. Carol, uh, uh, something to add or something, a different topic or the same? I don't often think in these terms, but this <clears throat> particular passage really brought it home. So often when the temple is talked about, it's talked about with its beauty and and all the adornment. But <clears throat> I just cook steaks on the grill. And um, it, with all this bloody sacrifice going on all the time, it had to be a pretty smelly place. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why they had the incense going too, right? And um, and you think about all of the blood that was spilled and sprinkled on the people, and and they had to clean that up afterwards too. Now clean up, clean up the altar. Think of cleaning the grill after you do the steaks. Yeah, very very good point, Carol. Niles, it smells like barbecue, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and I I have cleaned meat. I don't have all the entrails and everything else going on either. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. But you, um, yes. Uh, and one more point I wanted to make about that sacrifice, Christ completed. And it says the waiting here. Don't picture Christ, though, waiting in heaven without doing anything. Right? Uh, while he's waiting until his enemies are footstool, uh, footstool for his feet. He's actually active here with us, right? As he said, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So we don't take this passage at the exclusion of what Christ has said he's doing elsewhere. And, and again, the, like I said with uh, verse 10, uh, verse 14 has another uh, reference to that sacrifice in the, the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Uh, again, this one sacrifice, that repetition of the word one, we add another thought here, made perfect forever. That's that thought of justification. Um, the Hebrew uses this verb five times in the book of Hebrews, not Hebrew. The book uses the Greek verb form five times, the noun three times of perfection, and then perfect as the adjective is one time. Uh, and remember that made perfect is the word for achieving the goal, re reaching the goal um, that you that you have. And that's, again, holiness being with God forever. And that's given to us in Christ's work, and it's already accomplished. And yet at the same time, here we have sanctification uh, now in the narrow sense. We're being sanctified, giving us just a little bit of a hint of what's going to be coming, uh, starting with verse 19 of chapter 10. Uh, living a holy life, living uh, as close to the holiness that God has given us, we want to do that to tell God thank you. Any other questions uh, through verse 14? 
Sue, I'm not sure if I had you read yet. If you did, you're going to get to read again, if you don't mind the taking verses 15 through 18. Nope, I'm waiting for my turn. The Holy Spirit also testifies in scripture to us, for first he said, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their mind. Then he adds, and I will not remember their sins and their lawlessness any longer. Now where these sins are forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and we have, again, another repeated thought. The Holy Spirit, again, is uh, also testifies in Scripture um, that that footnote here in, in, in that verse, uh, that quote of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, talking about how he testifies, um, that testimony appears a number of times um and then and that it refers to the word scripture you know the old testament scriptures and then what did he say first of all here we have a repetition from chapter eight if that sounds familiar to you words from jeremiah chapter 33 um it was a longer quote in chapter eight but here we focus on the end of the quote the covenant i will make with them the better covenant, the one-sided covenant, not the I'll do this for you, God, and you do this for me. But this is God saying, now I'm going to do it. And how is it better than the Old Testament? Well, it's not the exterior motions and actions, cleaning the, cleaning the exterior, uh, repeated sacrifices of that exterior cleaning. God says, I'm making an, an interior change. My laws on their hearts, my word written on their mind, so that 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 actually cleaning where it needs to happen. That's that first statement of the first benefit of this new covenant sacrifice. And then verse 17 adds the other thought from Jeremiah uh, verse 34 here that I will remember their sins and their lawlessness, or I'll not remember it any longer. So that's the first 34. The first one was verse 33. And here's that complete forgiveness, right? Not taken away in the morning and then retaken away at night by the shadow of the animal sacrifice. Now, this is the one sacrifice, and God forgives and forgets. Uh, both the sins, the, the missing the mark, that's the picture word for sin, that Greek word for sin. Lawlessness is a Greek word that's basically not having the law. Living like you don't have the law is lawlessness. And then uh, we get back to the summary here of uh, the third summary in this section, pointing us back to the sacrifice where sins are forgiven no longer any sacrifice for sin all right so that's that's how we we see that superiority we no longer have to go to a temple or church pastor doesn't slaughter bulls or goats or sheep on the altar but we will go on in our next session to talk about the offerings of thanks uh, i'm going to introduce that in just a minute but any questions on this Jeremiah quote, the repetition of it, the understanding it in deeper detail, or anything about uh, this doctrinal section that's taken us up to here in the book? Okay. So um, just gonna point out that as we get into Hebrews 10, 19, we're gonna actually start the second section of Hebrews on Sunday, and what do you have to look forward to? Well, answering the question, what should we do with this supreme treasure? Uh, you the, supreme, the superiority of Christ? Well, let's serve him. And so we've been pretty deep with a theologian here and the writer to the Hebrews, these first 10 chapters, and it's been a struggle at times to get into the depth, the meat, and say, well, how does it apply? Now, um, the, this deep theologian is going to be very pastoral and say, friends, 
This is how it applies to your life. And I'm going to give you a vibrant and vigorous exhortation. Uh, that's what we're going to get here, uh, starting with verse 19, as we continue on Sunday. But any questions uh, before we wrap up with prayer? Sue, please. Back on verse 17, where it says, I will not remember their sins and their lawlessness any longer. Um, in, in, I, I don't know if God intended this at all, but in my mind, sin is definitely connected to offending God and not following his wishes. Lawlessness, I think sometimes could be um, interpreted as you know, more um, community or more societal and not necessarily offending God as much. So perhaps both of those words are used to cover all situations that people um, get themselves into and offend God. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, that's actually very, very astute uh, recognition, right? Missing the mark, sin, missing the mark of being perfect, like God says, lawlessness uh, has a little bit more of that aspect. If I don't have the law, if I'm without the law, the people that I'm living amongst, then they are affected. So you yeah, have both sinning against God and sinning against my neighbor. Obviously, when I sin against my neighbor, I'm breaking the first commandment too, right? Uh, so lawlessness breaks the goal, um, uh, the, the goal of, mis uh, of, of hitting the mark of, of the bullseye. Anything else to follow up with that, Sue? That was a good, very good comment. No, that was just something that occurred and I didn't know if I was on the right track. And that's why we need, we have these picture words that do bring out uh, pictures as we, as we dig deeply into them. Uh, let's close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy over and above sending us uh, that perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, uh, that he is all that we need to gain that entry into heaven. Help us hold fast to him. Help us uh, keep him first and that priority of staying with him with our trust and with that focus of our lives, even as we go about our, our daily uh, living on this earth. Bless us with that strength in this truth of forgiveness. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today.